Hi there. Uh, my name is Brian McLeod, uh, and I would really like to thank the uh, ILC um, and, uh, and Sandy uh, and the rest of the crew there of the Organizational Committee for in inviting me to speak to you today. Um, I have a particular fondness in my heart for this conference. I've learned a lot from it and from you folks in the past, and I'm excited to be here today to talk to you a bit about something a little different than I have in the past. Um, and specifically, I was asked to come and speak to you about the challenges of having a chronic illness and also supporting someone with a chronic illness um, or caring in a clinical or professional way for someone who's really struggling with a complex illness, um, uh, such as Ehlers-Danlos loss or hypermobility syndrome or MCAS or any of the other challenges that may face you folks. Uh, so a little bit more about me. Uh, I am... Um, a family physician trained chronic pain specialist um, with a particular interest in uh, hypermobility disorders, MCAS, POTS, that type of thing. Um, and uh, this is my disclosure slide, which is to say that I don't have a lot to disclose to do with this talk, hopefully no conflicts, certainly no financial ones. Um, and that many of these slides are done beautifully, which means I didn't do them. Uh, we're done by my co-presenter and colleague and, uh, and uh, slide artist, Monique Mercier, uh, with whom I teach um, the course from which these materials are drawn. So about the course itself. Um, today we're going to talk about a bit about self-compassion and burnout. So uh, when I talk about the course, um, I'm just going to go back up one slide. Uh, Monique and I have, uh, for two and a half years now, taught um, a course called Self-Compassion for Healthcare Professionals. Now, uh, self-compassion research is uh, almost 30 years now in the making, but uh, at the time that the course uh, was designed, it was about 20 years uh, of work done in the general population, looking at could we be kinder to ourselves? And in being kinder to ourselves, do we show evidence, as there is, of uh, decreases in things like depression, anxiety, uh, burnout, uh, as the title of our talk it takes. Now, uh, Dr. Uh, Kristen Neff, uh, psychologist who created that program very prophetically about two years before or two months before COVID started, uh, released a paper on self-compassion for healthcare professionals, which is simply a distillation of the 24-hour uh, public course into kind of like a six-hour snapshot for clinicians. And this, these were done over uh, lunch hours at uh, different hospitals in Texas for the pilot uh, and uh, six consecutive one hour talks and again was shown to decrease depression, anxiety, uh, stress, improve um, sort of self-compassion and, and, uh, and uh, quality of life. So uh, the important thing to recognize is all of these tools are pretty un universal um, and really apply to anyone who is either struggling with an illness or caring for people, either professionally or personally, uh, with someone who is struggling with an illness. So uh, hopefully uh, we will find resonance together today. Um, so self-compassion and burnout. Um, when we talk about uh, emotional pain, it often sort of comes from two different sources. So either the pain of disconnection, so things like feeling rejected, loss, loneliness, um, or in, and, and as will be uh, elucidated by the many wonderful patients who've come forward uh, to tell their stories today, um, the challenge of being othered, of either not being understood, of suffering in the absence of diagnosis, of being told that it's all in their head or, you know, it couldn't be uh, a being sort of removed um, and put aside. That's painful. Uh, and in turn, the pain of connection. So uh, for all of us who care for others who have illness or suffering, um, and nowadays, particularly in the days of COVID and inflation and war and all the other challenges we face day to day, um, we are connected to many people that are suffering and are ourselves suffering at times. And so there's pain associated with that. And so I'll talk a bit about both uh, in the context of our time together today. So when we think about the pain of disconnection, it's actually often a function of meeting unmet needs. 
And so let's talk a bit about what that might be. Um, if we think about, and, and one thing I want to encourage, I, I didn't mention this, but clearly this talk is recorded. Now, our actual course that we provide is highly interactive. Uh, and so what I want to encourage you guys to do is the only person who's not part of this conversation at the moment is me. Um, you have the chat there on Zoom, and I really want to encourage you to use it. If you are hearing things that resonate with you or don't resonate with you or have comments uh, to make about what you are seeing, I want you to uh, engage in the chat um, uh, as comfortably as you are, not disclosing anything you're not comfortable with. And of course, we'll all respect for confidentiality about anything that's mentioned, but, but really to engage with each other, because just as being othered is painful, being part of community and recognizing our common humanity and our suffering is actually very therapeutic. So um, one thing we might talk about is what is it to be othered and what kinds of emotions uh, are generated when we are uh, told we, you know, it's all in our head or it's, you know, can't possibly exist as a diagnosis or these symptoms don't exist or uh, just feeling unheard or unrecognized or undiagnosed and as you may have guessed, when we do this in person, we often lead to discussions around anger. Um, and one of the most important messages to get across is any emotion that you're feeling in the moment is okay. Often society emphasizes this idea that, that anger isn't okay, and particularly for those of us uh, identifying as, as female, um, us, actually I identify as male, it's a good point, but for those of you who identify as female, uh, uh, we're often, are often told that anger is not okay. Um, and, and to recognize that anger is just a symptom of something probably underlying. So what is it that's making you angry and to recognize that's a natural human response. So we could think of some positive things that anger might do for us. And I certainly encourage you to throw ideas into the chat. I won't pause for you to do that, but um, we recognize often that anger helps us state our boundaries, our limits, and recognize when people have crossed those boundaries. So part of self-compassion is being gentle and self, uh, self-supporting self and soft with ourselves. And we'll talk a, a little bit more to that uh, today. But um, part of it's also the sort of fierce compassion of stating our needs and stating our boundaries uh, and that that's okay. Once we've thought about that, uh, sort of recognizing our anger and saying it's okay to be anger, angry, maybe we explore a little bit as we are comfortable under sort of the deeper emotions that might uh, be underneath that. So. Is our anger actually a reflection of uh, feeling sadness, loneliness, longing, um, absence in our lives, um, feeling other? Is there some other aspect of things that we aren't feeling inadequate or shame is, is one that certainly can occur and spurn on anger? So what is that softer underbelly of our emotions? And in recognizing those and naming those, can we actually support ourselves for that hard reality? And if indeed shame or some other softer and more uncomfortable emotion is under all that, what is it that we might have in the way of unmet needs that if we met those, maybe it would soften our experience a bit. So all of humans have the need to be seen, respected, right? So again, if we're feeling othered, unheard, not diagnosed, uh, you know, just sort of underappreciated in our suffering, um, is that a respect thing? Feeling heard, loved, accepted. And when these aren't met, we can feel angry and hurt. And that is normal, it's human, and it's common. And then if the world isn't providing us those um, very important needs, can we actually meet our unmet needs ourselves and provide ourselves a little bit of self-compassion for how hard it is to um, to navigate the world uh, in this way. Um, if we can't find um, a sense of support from the outside world, can we recognize in ourselves our own strengths, what we bring, and then as well that it's hard, that what we are surviving is hard and, um, and how we feel is important. As we move on and talk a bit about the pain of connection, um, it's really important to recognize that we are evolutionarily, evolutionarily, 
Somebody want to spell that in the chat? I'll pretend I'm reading it. Apparently, I can't pronounce it. Uh, evolutionarily, oh, you must have spelled it correctly. Uh, we are um, highly social beings. So it, when we're, you know, whatever, 10,000 years ago, we're all in the cave together. It, in order to survive, you needed to be in the cave. And whatever the saber-toothed tiger, uh, the anthropologists in the room can tell me I'm, I'm wrong. But, um, you know, it's out there. And if we're not in the cave, then we're going to be food. Um, and so being part of community actually was something central to our survival. And when we feel othered or when we feel separate or isolated, it actually lights up the same parts of our brain as does chronic pain. So being othered or outside can be painful and painful in a very profoundly rooted in our brain kind of way. Um, the other thing to recognize is in order to stay in the cave, it was really adaptive and helpful if we could recognize other people's emotions and not just recognize them, but kind of take them on. If everyone's in the room's happy, maybe I feel happy too. If everyone in the room is sad, maybe I feel sad too. And the ability to resonate with um, community, uh, again, was highly adaptive. And we actually have these things called mirror neurons. Uh, in our brain, which are designed to resonate with the emotions in the room. So that's actually sort of the origins of empathy, that ability to resonate with and take on the emotions of those around us. And so what's really important with that is to recognize that uh, we may, in resonating so much in the face of suffering, uh, increase our own suffering and risk burnout. So I'll talk a bit about that. So empathic resonance is feeling what other, people's, uh, other people feel. It helps us connect and cooperate with each other. It's pre-verbal. We do not have to speak. You walk in the house, the spouse is angry or upset, and we get that before actually saying a word. Um, so in the face of a pandemic or elections in parts of the world where we're fearful of outcome, all of that can increase our... Uh, own suffering, our own tension without a word spoken. Um, and so, as I've mentioned, too much of it can lead to burnout. So what are the signs of burnout? Uh, we know that in he the healthcare community, uh, before COVID, the rate of burnout amongst Canadian family physicians was about 30%. We now recognize that Canada, or so not family physician, Canadian physicians was about 30%. And we now recognize uh, from a 2021 survey, the rate of burnout is around 53%. So this is a content and talk I often give to healthcare professionals, but it actually resonates with everyone. So how do we, all of us together, know that we are hitting our burnout, whether it's, uh, a, you know, if, if we are the individual who has a chronic illness and are struggling with our own self-care and with all of the work of getting diagnosed and seeing physicians and not feeling heard, um, how do we know when we're feeling burned out? If we are the caregiver who's supporting that person on this very hard and complex journey, how do we, how do they know when they're feeling burned out? And I encourage you to throw some comments into the chat. Uh, I can't read them at the moment, but you, the rest of you can communicate amongst each other. Um, and, and then I will throw up some of the things that we see, uh, just on a mental processing standpoint, uh, emotional level, we may feel that we are easily distracted, hard to focus, angry or irritable, and we talked about anger. Um, we may have challenges with sleep or insomnia. We know in our healthcare workers during COVID, the, the rate of, of sleep challenges was up to about 70, 80%. Uh, we may avoid people or things just because we don't have the energy to bring to the table or we specifically, they're, they're triggering us. There may be sadness or anxiety. Uh, and all of these things are common and to be recognized and realized. Uh, we may experience even the com more complex things like racing thoughts or depression, anxiety. Uh, we may have distress of, distressing or intrusive thoughts. So all of this is part and parcel of burnout. You don't have to check all the boxes, but to recognize that as we get to more and more of these symptoms, the ability to function and function well is impaired and we suffer. All right. So at this point in our burnout talk in our course, we usually go to an exercise um, on equanimity, on recognizing that we can't fix everything. Uh, the reason I chose not to do that today is the reality is that if um, you are uh, supporting someone who is uh, uh, has a chronic illness, 
they're very likely a relative or close. And that on the invested part is like a nine out of 10. And to say to you, you know, you're not, to, to try to practice having some distance in that is a pretty big jump right off the top. So uh, that is part of the course and a useful part and certainly for our healthcare professionals immensely helpful. Um, but I do want to talk to you about some other aspects uh, of burnout and our challenges and, and in particular um, being with, not fixing, not getting rid of, not pressing down, but being with difficult emotions. And all of us will experience in the course of something that is so challenging difficult emotions. So there are three ways of working with difficult emotions. One is, uh, the first is simply labeling uh, the emotion. Um, another is to find the emotions in our body. And then a technique called soften, soothe, allow that we will actually get to practice. So labeling emotions. Um, Labeling emotions simply by being aware, hey, I am feeling this way. So often we will, you know, send that email without thinking about it or, you know, have anger or shame, but not actually realize that we're in it. So that soft underbelly thing we talked about earlier. So shame is a go-to for me. If I'm feeling shame or did before and didn't recognize it, I might, you know, land, lash out in anger or defensively or a number of other ways. Um, without actually going, oh, yeah, you know what? This is shame. This is a hard way to feel. And so name it and you tame it is the language, the joke sort of phrase used in MSC around just this experience. Um, what's been shown is the amygdala, which is the bit of our brain that's responsible for emotions and fighting or, or fleeing, all of the big adrenaline rush kind of stuff, turns down as soon as we start naming our emotions, just allows us to soften everything a little. Doesn't get rid of them, just turns them down a little. So the first step is to actually say, wow, this is shame. And then how we la label the emotion is important. So if we are fearing, feeling fearful and we say, I can't believe you're feeling fearful, it's so stupid, you shouldn't be fearful. That's not really therapeutic, not really helpful, and not really self-compassionate. What we're looking at here is to recognize these soft underbelly emotions are hard. So to actually say, wow, this is sorrow. Um, you know, I, I don't feel heard. I've traveled a great distance to, to, uh, to see someone who I was immensely invested in getting answers from and I don't feel like I got them and I, and I feel sorrow. And that's a hard emotion. And so to, to, to support ourselves in the way a, a mother or a parent, a loving person might, a child, and hold that child and, and, and recognize that suffering uh, and that sorrow is important. So the way we do it is important in labeling. And then the other piece is that we will often get caught above our shoulders. In today's day and age, many of us, our minds are racing. What did I do yesterday? What have I got to do? This is my task list. And so we push and we push and we push. And we stay above our shoulders when we have emotions. I can't believe they did that. And this is this fact. And that's what this happened. And we sort of stay here. And there's some evidence to say that if we actually get down into our bodies, where are you feeling this emotion? Uh, is it something that you hold in your chest? Are you a person who feels your emotions in your belly? In, in all of that, if we can actually find that spot, um, we can often soften, not fix, not get rid of, but soften the emotional experience. Um, it's much harder, as the slide says, to manage our emotional experience through facts. And it's actually easier, again, from an evolutionary standpoint, to get into our bodies and to soften their location. And again, the emotion will often change. And then finally, this idea of softening, soothing, and allowing. So softening uh, in the body is physically compassionate. So that's what we were just talking about, finding the emotion and then softening around it. So there's different types of compassion we can employ here. Soothing is that verbal support of how labeling and saying how hard it is to have an emotion. And then there is an actual above the shoulders academic component, which is allowing this, saying, 
yeah, I am angry and I am being uh, belittled at work and and anyone who's belittled at work deserves to be angry. Um, and underneath that, I am feeling undervalued and I'm feeling like they're actually shaming me. So all of that is another reason. And what am I going to do about it? Well, I'm going to be self-compassionate with myself and maybe there are things I can do to be fiercely compassionate in support of the next steps. But the first step is to allow the emotion. It's okay to be angry. So I want to do a little bit of a, a practice that we can do together. Um, this is uh, something called being di with difficult emotions. Note, it does not say getting rid of or fixing or uh, suppressing difficult emotions. This is simply about being with them. What I encourage you to do is to grab a piece of paper and a pen, put those aside for the moment. And then all of this, can you can leave your cameras on, you can turn your cameras off. Um, but just to, to, to take a moment, get yourself comfortable in whatever position you're in. If you're lying down, you're lying down. If you're sitting, you're in your chair. But some get it comfortable. And then just take a moment to soften your gaze and close your eyes or um, whatever works for you. And I want to encourage people that at any point, if they feel uncomfortable, they can always step out of this exercise uh, and do what they need. Right? What do you need? Um, but um, this is a fairly straightforward exercise, so hopefully it won't cause distress to anyone. I uh, just get you to close your eyes, soften your gaze, and take a few comfortable breaths. Okay. And then what I would ask you to do is just, you know, placing your hand over your heart or your stomach or anywhere else that feels supportive, hold one hand with another, just to provide yourself a uh, soothing reference to know that you are safe. And then what we'd ask you to do is to think of, thinking of a, a mild to moderately distressing situation in your current life. Now, all of us, common humanity, will go to a nine out of 10, this is what's really bothering me, that we're only scientists here. We're just practicing, we're testing the waters. So something that's a three or four on a sort of scale of distressing is what we're targeting here. Mild to moderate situation that you're facing in your personal life right now it could be your professional life. And I really want to encourage you that you steer clear of family or friends or those you are actively supporting in care. Again, practicing three or four. You could be worried about an accomplishing a task, maybe a conversation with someone, um, maybe just feeling a bit stressed out about something should be enough to generate a little bit of stress in your body, but again, nothing nine out of 10. Now, with that in mind, gaze soften, maybe eyes closed, just to sort of envision the circumstance. Who was there? What was said? What happened? What might happen? Who was there? What was said? What might happen? What happened? I'll just give you a little bit of time to sink into that and remember. As you relive this situation, notice if any emotions arrive within you. And if so, seeing if you can label any emotion that comes up, give it a, give it a name. Oh, this is anger, this is sadness, Frustration, confusion, fear, guilt, shame. It's pretty common to have many emotions. So for the purposes of this experiment, of this exercise, 
We'll just get you to name the strongest emotion. See if you can identify what's most prominent and just we'll work with that. Now repeating the name of the emotion in a gentle and understanding voice. Just as if you were say validating or supporting a friend with the same struggles. That's longing. Ah, oh, that's grief. Sadness. Now expanding the awareness to your whole body. And again, recalling the difficult situation and just scanning your body where you feel it most easily. So again, who was there? What was said? What happened? Where is it in your body where you feel it most easily? You could sweep your body from head to toe and stop where you sense a little tenseness and discomfort. Sometimes these things don't stand out. We need to sort of find it. Feel what's feelable in your body right now. Nothing more. Don't have to add on. Now, again, if you can, choose a single location in your body where you're feeling the expresses itself most strongly. Could be a point of muscle tension, jaw tightness, chest, chest is my go-to. It could be an achy feeling, maybe you get a bit of a headache. And just in your mind, inclining gently towards that spot. So if you found it in your chest, you feel some test heaviness or tightness or just some anxiety. Softening into that location in your body. Letting the muscles soften, letting them relax, just as if in a warm bath. Softening, softening, softening. And just remember that we're not trying to change the feeling. We're just kind of holding that feeling in our body in a tender way. We're not trying to push it down, we're not trying to get rid of it, just softening around the edges. Now, if you wish, placing your hand over that part of your body that feels uncomfortable and just feeling the warmth and gentle touch of your hand. Perhaps imagining warmth and kindness flowing through your hand into your body sort of supportive touch that a friend might give you. Maybe thinking of your body as if it were a body of a beloved child, just soothing, feeling that touch, soothing you, soothing. And are there some comfort words you might want to hear? What would a friend, you say to a friend struggling in the same way? I'm so sorry you feel this way. I care about you. Be gentle with yourself. And if you need, feel free to open your eyes whenever you need to. Uh, or just let go of the exercise entirely. Get up, move, whatever you need to do. And finally, allowing the discomfort to be there. Again, not trying to fix or get rid of it. Just making room for it, releasing the need to make it go away. Just sitting with it. Allowing yourself to be just as you are in this moment. Softening. 
soothing, allowing, softening, soothing, allowing. Now letting go of this practice and expanding your focus to your body as a whole. Gently bringing your focus back to the room. Just allowing yourself to feel however you feel right now in this moment. And you can gently open your eyes. Take a few moments, you have that pen and paper with you. If you have any thoughts or comments or reflections for yourself, you could take a second and write them down. Some deep, gentle breaths. There is usually in a group where I'm not video recorded an opportunity to talk as a group. And again, we have the chat in front of us. And these are some of the questions that we might offer for people to reflect upon, excuse me, to reflect upon. Um, it's important to recognize that you don't have to share anything in the chat that is personal or that you don't want to share. Uh, but again, we can, we can learn a lot from each other, uh, uh, even with small sharings about what the experience was like. What was it like to label whatever emotion it was? I don't have to say. Did a, finding it in your body change the discomfort in some way? And the soft and soothe allow practice, how did that, what was that experience like for you? That's more or less the end of my talk. So we'll have a question period after Lisa's talk, which I'm looking forward to. And uh, we could explore some of these answers if you like. Um, so as we move forward into our lives, there's some invitations and only that invitations to in your weeks to come, try labeling some emotions. When you have an emotion, find, take a moment, find it in your body and label and find in a gentle and supportive fashion, not critical or angry. And then we could try the soften, soothe, allow practice. Now, if you're thinking, oh man, I won't remember it all. Uh, we have lots of references, lots of plays. Center for Mindful Self-Compassion is kind of the mothership in the States and uh, has tons of resources and recorded resources uh, available. Um, if you're wondering about the research underpinning all of this, uh, there's the NEF website, my website at MSC North, uh, and Kindful Psych is, uh, is Monique's. So I, I want to thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I will hand the digital can or, uh, microphone over to Lisa for... Uh, her talk, um, and I will make this slide set available to IELC for your future perusal. Uh, there's my contact information if you have any questions, uh, and uh, yeah, this has been an absolute pleasure.